just move across one though for the people that do arrive late. Righty ho, it's time, so we will start right now. My great pleasure to introduce Marshall Kirk McCusack, who is not doing anything about Linux. Isn't that great? BSD, something real. Please welcome him. Okay, well, it, it does seem appropriate, you know, that you should know that there is other technology out there, and it is open source, so you can go and, uh, you know, Never come up with a good idea when you can steal a better one. Um, this is a narrative history. Narrative means I'm not going to use my laptop. Instead, what I'm going to use is some written notes and just work off of those. Um, so it, I actually uh, made a little note on here that I should talk about the history of the history of talking about BSD. Um, these notes were written uh, as I was going to the first conference where I uh, presented this, which turned out to be the Australian Unix Users Group meeting in Perth in 1986. Now, <laughs> it turns out that in the previous decade, they had finally completed a single gauge of rail line across Australia. And so the government had begun running a train, which is known as the Indian Pacific Express. Uh, it runs from the Indian Ocean, which is to say Perth, to Sydney. And we were on this train, and I was writing the notes. So the, the, it's a little bit sort of bouncy on here as we're going across the Nullarbor Plain. Uh, and the Nullarbor Plain is really boring. You can sort of see the curvature in the earth, and every now and then a sagebrush or something will go by. Um, so it was a great time to sit down and write my talk. All right, so what I'm going to do is give you the sort of abridged uh, history here because it turns out that when I do the entire history in all the gory detail, it takes about three hours. And uh, they didn't give me a three-hour slot. And besides which, you would probably fall asleep if that were the case. Um, so there's, I would normally give you a lot of the, the sort of prehistory of Unix. Um, the, the short version of this is there was a thing called Multix. Uh, which was a joint project of MIT, General, uh, General Electric, and Bell Laboratories. Uh, General Electric was in the computer business at that time uh, and was building the machine. Uh, MIT was supposed to be bringing the, the sort of academic uh, expertise, and the people at the labs were supposed to be getting a certain amount of practicality into it. Um, it was one of these systems that failed from the sense that when they were just about to get something that would work, then they'd say, all right, well, we understand that problem, so now let's, you know, do this next thing. And so it would almost get there, and then they'd, you know, completely change things. And it would almost get there, and then they'd completely change things. And finally, the folks at, at the labs got fed up with this and said, enough is enough. We're, we're out of here. And so they exited this project, and the folks that had been working on that, uh, which included Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, were really bummed because they didn't really want to go back to punch cards on the IBM mainframe, which was the other alternative. And so they found a PDP-7 sitting in a corner somewhere and pulled it out and decided to start writing little, like a, well, an operating system, what we'd call an operating system today. Uh, but it didn't need a lot of functionality because all they really wanted to do was this sort of space war game. And so they needed just enough functionality to make that work. Uh, so they got that sort of going. And I mean, you know, this is the labs back in the days when it was the labs, and they could sort of do whatever they wanted to do. Um, and uh, but then they decided, all right, well, this is kind of cool, but it, they were pretty limited by what the PDP-7 could do. And they wanted to get one of these new, powerful, cool machines that was coming out called a PDP-11. Uh, it was a PDP-1120, actually. Uh, but the, the, they were sort of too expensive to get on the budget that they had available. And so they did what many technical people have learned to do over the years, and that is that you go find someone else within your company that has boatloads of money. That would be the legal department. <laughs> <laughs> well, the legal department, uh, you know, they had to do all these documents and so on, and you, the way you would do it is you would write it out, and then some secretary would type it for you, and then you'd mark that up, you know, and you'd change three things, and then they'd retype the entire page to, you know, get those corrections in and so on. 
And so they said, we can automate this for you. All you need to do is buy us this computer. Uh, and so the legal department's like, oh, sure, of course. That, that's easy. Um, and so they had Unix plus Roth, not you know NROF. That was the new Roth, but ROFF, which was the runoff program, which was the thing that they wrote for the legal department to, you know, so that they could fulfill that piece of their mission. Uh, I must say, if you look at Roth code, you can see that they didn't put a great deal of effort into it. They just sort of did what it minimally needed to do, which is why NROF had to come along later. Okay, at any rate, uh, they, the, the real goal of this was that they could start uh, doing this, this, big, this operating system. And Unix was supposed to be everything that Multics wasn't. And so, you know, where Multics would have eight ways of doing things, they would try and find the minimalist one way of doing it. And you might find that hard to believe looking at almost any Unix system today that it was supposed to be really simple, but that, that truly was the goal at the time. And one of the beauties of working in a 16-bit address space is that's about 10,000 lines of C code, and then you're out of room to do anything. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of scary today. I look at some of these disk drivers, and they themselves are bigger than the entire Unix kernel used to be. It's Anyway, uh, they started originally writing an assembly language because the belief at the time was that that's what you had to do operating systems in. Uh, but within a couple of years, they realized that you know, they could do better than that. And C was essentially written as a sort of glorified uh, macro assembler. Uh, I, you could look at a line of C code and pretty much tell exactly what the code was it was going to generate. At any rate, uh, by the between uh, the version 3 and version 4 um, was where they converted from assembly language to C. And this was done uh, within three years of starting, uh, which would have made it 1973. Uh, the reason that time starts on January 1st of 1970 is because that's when they started the project. Uh, at any rate, uh, they presented at SOSP, the Symposium on Operating System Principles, which is the sort of academic uh, OS conference. Uh, which is held every other year. And uh, there were, of course, a bunch of academics there that got, uh, you know, this looked really cool because here's a relatively inexpensive machine that gives us interactive stuff and, you know, nothing else essentially had that other than uh, things that ran on the mainframe but were much too expensive to actually use. So, uh, in particular, uh, Bob Fabry, who was a professor at Berkeley, thought this was very interesting. Uh, he talked to Ken Thompson, and within not much time, uh, Unix came to Berkeley. And they were able to buy, at the time, uh, a PDP-1145. Unfortunately, the CS department at Berkeley couldn't afford uh, an 1145 all to themselves, and so uh, they had to share with math and stat. So they went to the math and stat department, which was much bigger and had more money, uh, and so math and stat uh, basically put up a third each, and the CS people put up a third. And then, of course, the CS people wanted to run Unix on it, but the uh, math stat people would have none of this experimental operating system. Hoo-ha, you know, we had to run, uh, you know, something real, which was the, the DEC system that ran on that. And so then the question is, well, who gets to uh, run, you know, when does the CS department get to run Unix, and when do the math stat people uh, get to run their operating system? And so uh, what ended up happening was it was divided into three eight-hour periods and uh, rotating through the day. So Unix would run from midnight to eight, and then the next day, you know, the next go uh, day would be, you know, eight to two, or, or no, eight to four, and then four to midnight. And so it just would rotate around the clock, and you had to sort of be awake at whatever time it was that, you know, it was up and running. Um, this was sort of untenable, and so uh, fairly quickly uh, they were able to get their own PDP 1170 at that point. Uh, this was about the time that version six was coming out. Uh, and it turned out that uh, Ken Thompson is an alumnus of Berkeley, and so he actually came out to personally install it. And unfortunately, this was a bigger system than any that they had had back at the labs. It had not one, but two 28 megabyte disks on it. And so it turned out that the code that was supposed to let both disks operate at the same time <coughs> had a few race conditions in it and <coughs> didn't work very well. Uh, so Ken Thompson had to sort of debug that stuff. Anyway, uh, at the same time, this had been 75, uh, another student matriculates to Berkeley named Bill Joy, 
and uh, Bill Joy sort of gets excited about this stuff and uh, starts working with Ken Thompson, uh, really what we would today call as a system administrator, uh, essentially dealing with uh, taking care of the system and, and doing a lot of the stuff of that sort, but also getting a chance to get his hands in and see what's going on. Now, Bill actually had the same advisor that I did. Uh, both of us were getting our PhDs in programming languages. And so the sort of the first project he did was to write a uh, compiler for this new language that had just come out called Pascal. And uh, so, and then of course in trying to do that, then he would be very frustrated because the only editor we had was ED. Uh, and so he got involved in doing VI and then he didn't really like SH very much. Uh, so he did Seashell, and to this day I can't understand how someone who was getting a PhD in programming languages could have so thoroughly botched up you know, the syntax of something like Seashell, but you know, go figure. Anyway, uh, as Bill started doing these projects, uh, he would make them available to the rest of the world, uh, mostly by talking them up at conferences and things. And so people would send in tapes, these are 8-track tapes, and he'd spool up. Uh, and his first distribution was in 1977, uh, which included uh, Pascal and uh, the, e the EX terminal, uh, or the EX editor, uh, and a very early sort of version of VI that had uh, term cap associated with it. Uh, term cap was because we had two different terminals types, uh, and so instead of hard coding it in there, he put he did term cap to differentiate them. Uh, he later told me that that was the biggest mistake he ever made. He said because it allowed this proliferation of terminals that just all had bizarre escape sequences, etc. Uh, he wished he'd never done that. At any rate, that uh, put out about 30 copies of that, uh, and it was just called BSD. It's like, you know, the, when a uh, rock group puts out their first album, they just call the name of the album as the name of the rock group, and then what happens when they put out their second album? Uh, so it's the same thing. It's just called BSD, and so then when the next one comes out, what are we going to call it? Well, it'll obviously have to be 2BSD. 2BSD uh, came out about a year later. Uh, it had updates to Pascal. Uh, it added Seashell at that time, uh, and about 75 copies of that went out. Um, it led to later things uh, like 2.9 all the way up to 2.11, uh, which were continued releases for the PDP-11. Bill did not get involved in those releases, um, but other people did that at Berkeley and elsewhere. Meanwhile, in 1978, uh, the department bought uh, a VAX. In fact, it was serial number seven. Uh, and this was because there was a group there that was working on a thing called Vaxima, which was this equation solving thing uh, that basically ran on Lisp. Uh, the problem with Lisp is that you say Lisp and then by the time you get your first prompt it's already consumed like all the memory on the machine and then it's extra if you want to do anything after that. Uh, so uh, the, the TDP-11 just didn't cut it at all. The VAX, however, had two megabytes of memory so you know, we could really run giant stuff on this. Um, we got an, uh, of course, when it came from DEC, it had VMS on it and uh, there were people like Bill that said, well, of course, we should be running Unix on this. There was a quick and dirty port done uh, at the labs called 32V, but it was just literally sort of the minimal port from the PDP-11 version. So it didn't use any of the paging hardware on the VAX. Uh, it just did fixed uh, processes. And the uh, problem with that was that Vaxima needed more than two megabytes to run, and so they insisted, well, we've got to run VMS because, you know, it's got to have virtual memory. And Bill's like, ah, he's pulling his hair out about this. So he runs around the department and finds this guy named Oza Babagalu, whose his PhD is on virtual memory stuff. And he has sort of this prototype thing, and Bill says, oh, good, we'll just drop this into 32V and then we'll have paging. Um, and one of the things I will say about Bill is that he, he's very good at sort of figuring the minimal amount of work to get from where he is to what he wants. Uh, someone asked me once to compare myself to Bill, and I said, you know, there's nothing that he's done that I couldn't do. It's just that it would take me like 10 years to do what he does in one year. Uh, the problem is that when he's done, you can't touch it because you change a single line and it just collapses in a puddle. Um, you know, it, 
look at VI, you know. It's like it had just to be rewritten from the ground up before you could change it. Um, at any rate, uh, so Bill goes in, hack, 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 and uh, he, there's only the one vex, so if you're going to test stuff, the only time it can be tested is over the Christmas break. So classes end about middle of December, and he has until the middle of January, and if it's working by then, then it's going to run. And if it's not working by then, it's VMS for the next, you know, six months. So I, for various reasons, was actually around over that Christmas trying to get work done because it was one of the few times when the machine wasn't super busy. So I'd be working along, and it would be, uh, you know, running 32V at that point, and then it would, you know, message machine going down to boot VM Unix, you know, and da 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 da, you know, and then you'd come up and it, you know, VM Unix prompt, you'd log in, you'd be typing away, typing away, and then it'd all freeze, and then there'd be a little break, and then 32V would come back up. And uh, so this is what happened, but it was more and more time running VM Unix, and by the time classes were ready to start, it mostly worked, and it was really about another month before it really worked, but um, we never looked back, never ran VMS again on that machine. Anyway, um, he put all that stuff together, and that, this became 3BSD. So 3BSD was the first BSD uh, which included not just some utilities and so on, but it was an operating system and libraries and everything. So it was uh, the first whole and complete system. And of course, BSD has been that um, ever since. So that was 1979. About 100 copies of that got sent out. And you have to understand now with 3BSD, we've got a whole bunch of AT&T code in there because it's you know, a lot of the AT&T kernel and a lot of the AT&T utilities. Uh, it's really just sort of AT&T stuff with some BSD stuff sprinkled through it. So at this point now, of course, you have to have an AT&T source license to be allowed to get the BSD. Um, so you have to understand that Bill was a student, he was developing all this stuff, and he was also the distribution coordinator. So there were several of us students sharing an office with him, because that's the way it worked. And the phone would ring, and you would just hand the phone to Bill, because you just knew it was, you know, no one else was going to ever call. And, you know, so it, the conversation would go approximately like this. Hi, yes, you want to get BSD. Okay, uh, send me a tape, you know, and I will put it on there and, and mail it back to you. Oh, you do have an AT&T license, right? Okay, good. Um, end of, well, the, the university sort of cottoned on to what was going on here, and they decided this was perhaps not the optimal way to do this. And so they said, all right, you know, enough is enough of this. We, you, know, you have to do real license verification. And Bill's like, I am doing license verification. I'm asking them if they have a license. They wouldn't lie to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, the... the uh, BSD, well, in this sort of time frame, this is now the early 80s, or 1980 really, um, the uh, DARPA begins to decide that they want to uh, start getting a little, uh, well, they, they have a whole bunch of different contractors that all have different machines running different operating systems using different programming languages, and it's almost impossible for any of their contractors to share code of anything that they do. Everything is, you know, immediately has to be re-implemented. And so they wanted to pick a common hardware platform and a common software platform. And uh, so they, there, there's a long and interesting story about, well, they picked the VAX, and then the long and interesting story about whether they should run VMS or Unix on it. Um, but I don't have time to go through that wonderful little <laughs> ditty. Uh, but in the end, they decided that it was going to be Unix uh, and that Berkeley would be sort of the, would be funded to do the base system. Uh, and then, of course, one of the key things they wanted to get into it was this new networking thing called uh, TCP IP uh, that was going to replace NCP. Uh, NCP had this sort of limitation that it could only have 256 hosts, and uh, they were fast approaching this limit. So, uh, but they didn't really trust Berkeley to do like TCP IP because that was like this complicated networking protocol. So that would be uh, handed off to, uh, uh, God, who was it? BBNN, yeah. thank you. Um, handed off to BBNN to do, and then all that Berkeley would do would be to design the, 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 the API, so the socket interface, basically. And uh, so at any rate, uh, you know, 
This money comes in, and the key thing is that it now allows, first of all, Bill to get paid a salary, and more importantly, a, a, an assistant admin, or a sysadmin to be uh, hired, or not a sysadmin, but an, an administrative assistant who was going to do all of the license verification, who would actually make them send a copy of their license and then call AT&T and verify the license and all this other stuff, so that Bill no longer had to do that, which was good because the number of copies just kept rising. Uh, so, to, sort of as a prelude to the, the, the serious DARPA work getting done, uh, 4BSD was released, which sort of wrapped up everything that was sort of ready at that point in time. Uh, so it had things like job control got added. Uh, the file system went from using 512 byte blocks to 1K blocks, which doubled the performance. Uh, they had auto reboot up to that point. You had to manually deal with it. Uh, friends Lisp, Deliver Mail, which you heard about earlier today, uh, and that came out at, in October of 1980, and about 150 copies of those got distributed. Remember that one copy goes to like a university and gets completely used on all of their machines, or a company gets one, so 150 copies is a very wide uh, usage. Okay, so then the DARPA funding really begins. There's the big debate about you know, which one they're going to run. Uh, ultimately, they decide that it's going to be uh, Unix. And so uh, serious, serious, uh, serious development begins. So Bill gets the, the socket stuff you know, organized. And uh, he wants to test it. And so he goes to... Uh, Rob Gerowitz, who's the person at BBNN that's overseeing the development, and he says, well, you know, can I get like, you know, an early release of your, your code? And sure, of course. And so you know, he gets the tape and he puts it on and puts it in and hack, 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 gets, you know, the interface to sockets going. And then we had uh, actually a prototype of the thing called Ethernet. You may have heard of this uh, from the Xerox Park folks. And but it was the early Ethernet, so it only ran at three megabits, not ten. Uh, so we had the two machines and this three megabit Ethernet between them. And Bill fires it up, and he needs to, you know, test copy a file across. Well, of course, you know, you're supposed to have FTP, but FTP hadn't been written. So uh, he did this little fast hack called RCP. Uh, and then the, in order to do remote login, you, you know, we were supposed to write Telnet, but, well, we didn't really have time for that right away. So he did a little fast hack thing called R login. <laughs> <laughs> they never should have been let out. They just, you know, we knew at the time they were a disaster. <laughs> But um, at any rate, uh, so he fires up RCP and copies the file across. Well, BBNN had this, uh, this you know, great layering, and there was a state machine, and all these things in there that, you know, the, what you're, the way you're supposed to design code. But uh, in Van Jacobson's uh, words, uh, layering is a great way to design protocols, but it's a crappy way to implement them. They're really inefficient. And so Bill fires this up and tries to copy a file across. Well, all that BBNN had been running on were the 56K backbones. We had a VAC 750, which was 0 0.7 MIPS. And the, it was so much computation that you completely saturated the CPU by the time you were getting 56KB throughput. Well, Bill was going to have none of this. I mean, we have three megabits. Why we, you know, we want to get that bandwidth out of here. So, hack, 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 hack. You know, we have this state machine. We'll just turn that into a big switch statement with a few go-tos between them for the state transitions, <laughs> etc. Um, right. Anyway, he had it so that you could copy a file from one 750 to another over three megabit and get the full bandwidth. Huh. Okay. So, anyway. Uh, there's another sort of interesting story that I don't have time to tell, but it's uh, how I got sucked into um, writing this little file system thing. Uh, Bill had done sort of an I had sort of an outline of what ought to be done, and I needed a summer job for various bad reasons. And he says, "Well, here, just do a little prototype of this, you know." And so I did this as sort of a summer project, and of course, got sucked in and, and spent 18 months getting it all working because uh, he didn't tell me that I had to do dump, restore, FSCK, <laughs> etc. Anyhow, uh, we finished this up, and we actually released uh, sort of an early release of this. And what we wanted to call it was 5BSD. You know, 1BSD, 2BSD, 3BSD, 4BSD. What do you call the next one? 5BSD. However, 
AT&T had just released something called System 5, and they were concerned that there would be marketing confusion if there was something called 5BSD and System 5, and so we could not call it 5BSD. So my attitude at the time is, great, we'll call it 6BSD. <laughs> <laughs> But for various reasons, that decided we would call it 4.1, uh, and then 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, etc. Um, so that's how that came about. Anyway, um, we uh, released this thing, which had the preliminary uh, TCP/IP code as hacked up by Bill, uh, and uh, this was called 4.1a, and this. Uh, got fairly wide distribution because there were a lot of people that really wanted to use it. A lot of people really hammering on it, uh, a lot of uh, bug fixes and enhancements and other things. Uh, another important thing is that Sam Leffler joined the project. And Sam, unlike Bill, actually had some background in networking and made some very important changes to the, the uh, API. Uh, notably, it used to be that when you'd have a, a TCP socket and someone would connect to it, that port was tied up until you finished whatever you were doing. So if you had an SMTP server on port 25 and someone connected, no one else could connect to port 25 until that TCP, you know, that session was done. And Sam's like, uh, no, no, no. Believe it or not, you, you might want to have more than one incoming mail connection at a time. Bill's like, oh, really? <laughs> so anyway, the API got uh, changed to add the accept system call to you know, essentially pop off connections uh, as they come in, um, which was <laughs> an important improvement. Uh, at any rate, uh, I finished up the file system. Uh, that system was released along with these bug fixes as 4.1b. Uh, then the, there was all the, the, the revision to signals. Uh, again, it's, not, it's an interesting story, but one I won't go into. Uh, that came out as 4.1c. And then 4.1d was supposed to have the new VM system in it. Um, but Bill got kind of sidetracked by this company uh, in the South Bay um, called Sun Microsystems. Uh, he, of course, went off to be one of the, the founders of it and then tried to convince me that I should go along. And uh, I said, well, you know, Bill, I'm only a year away from my PhD, and I know that you say I can finish my PhD if I'm there, but I know startups don't work that way, you know. And, and besides which, you know, this is the workstation market. Apollo's got a three-year jump on you. You know, they've got all the applications locked in. You know, how do you ever expect to succeed, you know? And he's like, oh, you know, open, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, right, okay, I'll talk to you when I'm done. Well, it took me 18 months to finish my PhD, and by that time, Sun was like, you know, out there running, and the interesting stock options were gone. But I was a consultant to Sun and uh, uh, to port the Pascal compiler for them. And so I ended up getting a few thousand shares of Sun stock, which ultimately turned to be quite valuable. Um, <laughs> which is why I can you know, just wander around the world and give talks like this these days. <laughs> at any rate, um, the, the VM system did not get done at that time. Uh, instead, there was too much pressure to release 4.2, uh, which we did. Uh, and in, that would have been in uh, August of 1983, and about a thousand copies of this got shipped out. Um, so it, it was still, at that time, the predominant Unix system that people were using. They would buy the AT&T li uh, license, they'd put the tapes on the side, and they would just immediately get the BSD and drop it on there. Uh, so it was sort of the heyday of, of the BSDs, certainly. Um, problem was that it wasn't open source because there was all this AT&T code. So you had to have an AT&T license. At the time, it was cheap to buy an AT&T license, and so that wasn't really much of an issue. Um, however, the folks from BBNN had finished TCP at this point and had sent us the final thing and were dismayed to discover that we hadn't put it in. Well, again, there's a, a very long and amusing story here that I don't really have time to tell all of, but uh, what ultimately happened was that uh, Berkeley and BBN agreed to have a bake-off, uh, and we had to find a neutral third party, and DARPA suggested this guy named uh, Mike Moose at the Ballistic Research Lab in Aberdeen, Maryland. And, uh, you know, he, he, he had been involved with various other DARPA things, so he was good with DARPA, and he was buddy-buddy with some folks at BBNN, so they thought they had an inside edge. On the other hand, he had done a whole lot of development of what we were shipping, and so, you know, we knew that he had a certain interest in that as well, so fine, you know, that sounds like a good neutral party to us. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, 
he does a bunch of tests. And one of the things that's really important to DARPA is when you have high packet loss. Uh, because, you know, someone drops a nuclear bomb on Chicago and it has to figure out that, you know, it has to route around through Texas or something. Anyway, uh, so one of the tests, we, we were just maximal throughput basically on good connections is what we really optimized for. Whereas BBNN had spent a lot of time worrying about lost packets and other things. And so one of the, the key tests that was to be run was one where they would lose about every fourth or fifth packet. Uh, and see what, you know, the retransmissions and all that stuff was going to work. And so we, of course, don't find this out until we've already, you know, shipped it and, and, and we get back, you know, what the tests are going to be. And it's like, Ugh. So uh, at any rate, uh, the Mike Moose's report comes and, of course, you immediately go to the last page and see what the conclusion is going to be. And he carefully doesn't let, really let you know. So you actually have to read the thing through. And it... it <laughs> It's a really amusing read because he, he talks about, you know, first of all, when there's no packet loss, you know, BSD does this, you know, and BBN is down here. Um, but, you know, now we turn to the test where we're going to be losing a quarter of the packets or so. And uh, so what we find is that, you know, BBN gets off to an early start. You know, they're getting much more data through than the B BSD is. Um, however, while BBN is rebooting, BSD catches up. <laughs> I guess you can figure out where it went from there, because of course our whole point was ours was better debugged. Um, at any rate, uh, that held up the release of 4.3 uh, for a very long time. I mean, almost a year while all of this argument was going on back and forth. Uh, and uh, you know, finally, we got blessed to, to release that, and we did it. Uh, so that became um, the 4.3 release. Which, where did I say? It, that came out finally in June of 1986. Uh, so we had been, uh, we said in June of 85 that it was going to come out. Uh, and it, that was already two years. So it, it had been a long time. There was a lot of demand. Finally, we got that out. OK, so uh, meanwhile, this guy named Keith Bostick, we, we, we have a little bit more money that's available to us now. So we decide to add a, a third programmer to the uh, BSD team. Uh, this would be Keith Bostick. He came to Berkeley. Uh, one of his uh, requirements in coming was that he would be allowed to finish uh, 2.10, which was the PDP-11. He wanted to take the TCP-IP code and put it into the kernel that was released on the PDP-11. Well, TCP-IP code all by itself was the entire address space of the PDP-11. And so this was quite a challenging problem because you had to do what's called overlays, where you essentially have two sets of things and you flip the map registers as you cross from one segment back and forth. Um, mind-boggling. I mean, I admire the problem, but it was mind-boggling, and neither Mike nor I could understand for the life of us why he wanted to do this. But sure, you know, in, in all your spare time, I mean, there's only, you know, three things you need to do here. Uh, one is you're going to have all technical support that comes in on the phone. Two is all technical support that comes in from email. Uh, and three is some of these other programming projects we have for you. But any spare time you have after that, feel free to do it. And, uh, and, Somehow he did all of that. Anyway, he finally got 2.10 going. And we had a party to celebrate the fact that he'd finally gotten this done. And at the party, he opens the window to his office. We're on the fourth floor of Evans Hall. You know, looks down to make sure that there's nobody below and drops the PDP-11 out the window, smash onto the concrete four stories below. We're like, Keith, what did you just do? He said, I never want to see that PDP-11 again. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so after that, we had his full attention on what we were doing. <laughs> so uh, at this point now, uh, AT&T, which used to sell their source licenses for uh, about $20,000, uh, had started raising the price. So at, by this time, it's about a quarter million dollars, and that's to run it on one CPU, one machine. And there were a bunch of people that wanted to build these products, which were sort of cards that you could plug into PCs. Because PCs were so feeble that they couldn't really run networking. So you'd have to build a separate card that had a, its own CPU on it that would do the protocol, and then you would just sort of stuff the things back into the PC. 
and they needed a TCP IP stack. They wanted to get the one from Berkeley. We, of course, had completely written that ourselves. That was, there was no AT&T code. The only networking that was in AT&T was UUCP. So they said, well, could you release just the networking stuff? Uh, under a freely redistributable license. And Keith was really hot to do this. And so um, we went through and we took you know, all of the TCP IP stack and sockets and all that out. And then we threw in uh, Telnet and FTP and regrettably RCP and our login and uh, put this out. And this was, we called this networking release one, which uh, Again, we were ready to release it in about 1988. It took about a year to talk to the Berkeley lawyers to get them to sign off on doing this. They, of course, saw dollar signs. We're going to make all this money. Uh, but luckily, we had been funded by DARPA. And one of the things we could show them in the DARPA contract was that this had to be made available you know, freely because it had been paid for by the government. And so it's to the people. And you know, this is Berkeley, so you can have some great arguments with the lawyers on this line. <laughs> At any rate. Um, so the, we, we get this license written, and it's, you know, we tell them, well, it has to fit in every file, because, of course, they wanted this thing that was you know, 19 miles long. We said, no, no, we have to put that in every file. There wouldn't be enough room on the tape if we had to you know, have this huge thing in every file. So um, we got it down to what's now referred to as the Berkeley license. Uh, in fact, it had four clauses, and the newer ones today have only two. But at any rate, uh, we put this out, and this was a wild success. Um, we figured we'd sell three copies. You know, one would go to UUNet, uh, who would put it up, and everyone would just download it for free. Um, but it turns out you could pay $1,000 to Berkeley to get it. And to our amazement, about 1,000 people sent in their money because they wanted that piece of paper from, signed by the Berkeley lawyers saying, this is freely redistributable. <laughs> Great for us. It was like, you know, that was our budget for several years. <laughs> OK, so um, we decided, uh, you know, we, we continued doing our development um, of the mainline system. Uh, the next system that should come out was 4.4, but Mike Carls, who was sort of organizing when the distributions ought to come out, had this thing in his mind of what 4.4 was supposed to have in it. And he wasn't going to call it 4.4 until this, all these things were done. And so we started coming out with 4.3 Tahoe and 4.3 Reno and all these sort of intermediate releases. Uh, and then finally, uh, when Mike eventually left and I was totally in charge, 4.4 came out, even though it didn't have everything that Mike wanted to have in it. <laughs> Uh, so we did the Tahoe release, and that was primarily to support a second architecture. Uh, and then uh, the next interim release after that was 4.3 Reno. Uh, that had the new virtual memory system. Again, I don't really have time to tell that whole story, but um, it, we essentially started from mock. We didn't like the API, but the, the code was pretty solid, so we brought that in uh, and then put the MMAP interface on it as opposed to the messaging stuff that they used. Uh, also, uh, NFS came in at that point in time. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but the, the, the sort of the, the real driving thing that was happening at this point was the release of Net1 had put pressure on us to do release more. You know, there's, there's lots more cool stuff in there. You know, can't you release it? And uh, Keith Bostick, in particular, was really gung ho. That, you know, he was like, we should do this. And Mike and I are like, you know, Keith, it's one thing to get the kernel, but there's all these utilities and all this, you know, it's just a, too big of a project. So if you can figure out something to do with the, the, the utilities and libraries, you know, you, you let us know, and then, you know, then we'll talk about the kernel. And then we figured that was the end of it. We weren't going to hear about it anymore. Um, but we underestimated Keith. Keith, of course, couldn't do this himself. So we would go to USENIC's conferences, and Keith would put up a list of all the utilities and libraries that were needed to be rewritten. And the thing was, you know, rewrite these utilities, you know, and then you'll get your name in lights. You know, you'll contribute it to Berkeley, and you know, we'll say how wonderful you are. And you know, that sort of works for a while. You know, someone will do LS and CAT and stuff like that. But when he started getting things like, you know, T Roth and uh, you know. The, some of the, you know, like the nastier bits of the C library. And you know, so he comes marching into our office. He says, well, I've got it, you know, two-thirds of the utilities and uh, nearly the entire library. How's that kernel coming, guys? And I looked at Mike, and Mike looked at me, and we're like, you know, we can't really use the same technique you're using. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we set about uh, trying to figure out, well, you know, 
where is the AT&T code? Because you know, the, the way you do C code is you, know, you don't rewrite everything. You, know, you grab a piece here and grab a piece there and put it together and sort of glue it together. And so you know, stuff that might you know, have originated over in the terminal driver somehow ends up you know, over here somehow. Uh, and so we have to identify all of the AT&T code. So we came up with this sort of amusing technique. We first ran the entire kernel through CB, the C beautifier, which just puts it in a canonical form. And we took 32V and did the same thing with it. And then we built an inverted database, a line-by-line -line database of 32V. And then we took every line of our code and compared it against the 32V. And anytime you'd get a run of two or three lines in a row that matched two or three lines in a row out of 32V, you'd go, aha, something needs to be dealt with here. And mostly it was just stupid stuff like, you know, a linear search through the process table. It's like, well, that's dumb. You know, let's just hash that, you know. And it improves the performance and gets rid of that bit of code. So anyway, when the dust all settled, we were down to about six files that were left that still had any significant amount of AT&T code. And my attitude was, well, let's just rewrite these six files, you know? How hard can it be? And Mike's like, you know, if we release a complete kernel, that's going to really get them going. But if we just release, this is a partial kernel and some utilities and stuff, you know, like we did with Net1, it'll be fine. Uh -huh. Well, we went and talked to the lawyers, and we didn't want to get them too stirred up. So we said, this is just sort of an expansion of the previous one. We want to call this networking release two. Uh, <laughs> despite the fact that it contains 95% of the system. Uh, and most of the stuff that we threw out was like the console driver for the VAX. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the lawyers uh, say, well, you know, how close is this? And so we say, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, it, they said, well, we're not going to approve this. You know, it, that has to go to a higher level. So you know, it worked up to the head of the department. He didn't want to sign off. The head of the School of Engineering, he didn't want to sign off. Well, I, I'm not allowed to say exactly how high it went, but uh, th that particular chancellor was, um, <laughs> <laughs> he was very favorably uh, disposed to us and so uh, said, all right, I want you to get, or, told the lawyers, bring in some outside experts, have them do a, an audit and see whether these people really know what they're talking about. We passed the audit, and so out it went. And in fact, the initial release didn't cause any trouble. Uh, the trouble occurred when a guy named Bill Jolitz wrote the seven or six missing files and started having a system that would actually boot and run. And then the second problem was that uh, Mike uh, had left uh, to start a company called Berkeley Software Design Incorporated. And uh, being technical people rather than marketing people, they sort of did a few tweaks that wouldn't really be optimal. For example, uh, they got the, the phone number to order. It was 1-800-IT'S-UNIX. And uh, <laughs> they ran marketing campaign, you know, UNIX at, you know, 1% the cost of what you have to pay AT&T. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, this caught AT&T's attention. <laughs> They didn't like it, so they sued BSDI. Well, BSDI, remember I told you you could pay $1,000 and get a, license, a thing signed by the university saying that this is freely redistributable? They said, hey, you know, it's, here's this letter from the University of California. It says it's freely redistributable. All we did was write these six files. Which of these six files do you want to discuss with us? Well, of course, they really had written those, and they were completely clean. And so the, the lawyer or the, the judge that was overseeing the case was about to throw it out as, as you know, pointless case, and so they were forced to sue the university in order to uh, you know, stop it. And so now you have, instead of like a huge company against you know little tiny thing that's going to get just obliterated, now you've got you know, huge company against immovable force. And uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, this is where I began my career uh, learning about being an expert witness. Uh, one of the things that I'll remember to this day before I went into my first deposition was being prepped by the lawyer in which he said, now remember, a deposition is like getting a proctate exam from Captain Hook. <laughs> he wasn't kidding. <laughs> Anyway, again, it's, it's, it's a huge fun story to go through the whole lawsuit, which I also don't have time for. Uh, but ultimately, in the end, what it turned out was that the people at AT&T 
uh, had done some bad stuff. Like they had taken the TCP IP code, which of course they were free to do. The one thing that they weren't allowed to do was remove the copyrights, which they had done. So when they were comparing BSDI with their source code, they saw huge amounts of common code. Well, of course it was common code because they'd taken it from BSD. But there was no copyright, and the people that had done that were gone, and so they didn't realize what they'd done. And when this came to light after two years, um, they realized that they really didn't have a case, and so it all settled. Um, we agreed to, you know, throw, make some minor changes so that we could release something new, which we called 4.4 BSD Lite. Um, and uh, the agreement was that, that you know, they would bless this, um, and, uh, but we had to say that the Net2 could not be used because they figured that was going to you know, set back BSDI because they were going to have to start all over again and that it was going to you know, essentially put a damper on things. Uh, turned out it didn't, but uh, at any rate, uh, the settlement came and uh, the, the, at the end of the day, we ended up having to add USL copyrights to 70 files, along with things saying that they were freely redistributable. These were common header files, which had been discovered to be essentially in the public domain. And uh, we had to delete uh, three files. And there weren't really three files to delete in the kernel. And so I remember going out for a conference with our lawyers, and they say, look, we don't care what you pick. Just pick something because, you know, they have to save face. So we came back in and said, uh, okay, uh, what we've decided that we're going to get rid of uh, are, is the, the System 5 IPC emulation, uh, the System 5 shared memory emulation, <laughs> and the System 5 semaphores. Oh, please don't make me take that stuff out of the kernel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the, uh, the upshot of that was that 4.4 uh, BSD Lite went out. That generated another 1,000 people paying $1,000. Uh, so we, sat on, we had another million dollars coming in. So we actually spent like another two years just sort of making little changes and bug fixes and a few other things. And we finally did one more release, 4.4 Lite 2, which was the sort of bug fixed version of that. Uh, but at any rate, the, it was really the 4.4 BSD Lite, um, which was in the genesis of the various BSDs um, that are out there today. And again, I could go through all that, but I have more than used up my time. But you see, this where I've told you there's all these fascinating stories that I didn't get a chance to tell you allows me to do my uh, promotion of my DVD. <laughs> so you can get all three, slightly over three hours of uh, these stories uh, for a mere $20 for the first... 10 people that come down and ask for it. Uh, also, uh, you can get it off my website, www.mcusic.com. All right, so I have zero time for questions, but I'll take a question anyway. Okay. Question time, anyone? First, was it just one, was it? Yeah. Come on, somebody's sure. got to have at least one. Question. Yep, I'm sure that nervous people here in your presence. <laughs> Um, so, w when you read the classic email fight between um, between Linus and um, the name escapes you, Tannenbaum, about Multics and Linux, what, what was the BSD creator take on? Um, well, by this time, I, I was actually at the the first public speech that Linus ever gave on Linux, which at that time was really just, he was slightly past being a terminal emulator at that point. Yeah, it was 10,000 lines. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, after that, you know, I said, well, you know, why did you, you, know, why did you start this thing, you know, because we've, we've got BSD here. And he said, well, you know, it was all tied up in litigation. You know, that litigation could have gone the other way, and then there would have been nothing, you know, so we had to do something there. And, uh, you know, he's never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? All done. All right. Well, on that um, note, I would like to present you with a lovely macadamia husk bowl, all right. um, but unfortunately you would have heard about all the floods and what have you. Um, we actually ran out, but we've still got the boxes. Um, <laughs> but what you wouldn't know, the floods, continuing on the flood theme, started all the way up north, went all the way south, right to Melbourne. Melbourne guys, pretty much flooded out too. It, it did go further inland as well, so we tried to find something appropriate for you. No, that way up, that way up. That way up. Because that 
is all that's left of Uluru. <laughs> thank, thank Marshall very much.